Lord Adair Turner, thank you very much for joining us here at the Fung Global Institute. Let me talk to you uh, about your new role mm. and uh, your transition into a new book. You say it's about capitalism, so where are we now with capitalism? Well, I think the market economy, capitalism, uh, has proved the best mechanism we have for delivering uh, prosperity. Uh, it uh, has developed, delivered uh, huge prosperity in the developed world and increasingly a number of countries in the emerging market are making the breakthrough uh, to middle income uh, at least levels. And of course China's success it wouldn't describe it as a capitalist uh, economy or it would describe it as uh, probably a capitalism or socialism with Chinese characteristics or some other uh, interesting combination of words. But it's clearly a market economy in many aspects and it has many of the uh, aspects of uh, private capital uh, motivations. So it's at one level an extraordinary successful system. But there are major issues about it. Uh, one of them is the uh, extreme increase in inequality which is occurring in many developed and developing countries which I think we need to understand and offset because otherwise we will undermine the legitimacy uh, of this system. Uh, we also know that the finance aspects of capitalism are sources of huge instability uh, which I believe are avoidable uh, instability. We can avoid them uh, but they are self-inflicted wounds and there are very major issues about how capitalism, the market economy and growth left to itself uh, will damage the environment. So there are, within the basic context of the fact that uh, market economies clearly uh, succeeded uh, compared with planned economies, um, there are very major questions that we've got to ask about uh, how well capitalism going forward uh, will serve the needs of humanity and how we have to regulate, control, augment and complement it uh, to make sure that it does so. So here we are in Hong Kong talking about an east-west partnership, a dialogue between the two regions. What can we here in Asia learn from what's happened in the West? Well, I think one of the main things to learn for emerging markets in Asia or elsewhere is to avoid uh, some of the uh, completely unnecessary financial instability uh, which we allowed to occur in the West by falling in love with some intellectual delusions uh, about the nature of finance capitalism. Uh, finance is very different from other sectors of the economy. I mean, essentially, if you want good restaurants, there's no better formula than a completely free market. You know, some will fail, uh, some will succeed, some will manage to develop new styles, new ambiences, new menus that satisfy consumer expectations. Uh, any attempt to plan or regulate it uh, other than in health and safety fashions just doesn't really help at all. Finance is different. There's some things about the nature of finance and particularly about when finance creates debt instruments in excessive quantities which can create risks uh, which can create unnecessary what economists call rent extraction, people essentially uh, making lots of money from activities which are not socially useful, they're not a useful part of the market economy. And we failed to realize that in the developed worlds before the financial crisis. Uh, we fell in love with economic theories which believe that you could apply completely free market principles to finance as to any other sector of the economy. And that was a major intellectual delusion and one needs to be very careful of it. Uh, finance needs very careful regulation and in particular the processes of banking and credit creation need very careful regulation and control. So what are the cautions, what are the um, measures you think that um, Asia can put in place because obviously in India we're seeing a still very strong growth, China still very strong growth, Southeast Asia as well, Indonesia in particular. The temptation is to obviously open the markets up, open them up very rapidly. What could Asia do to uh, exercise caution? Well I think in relation to financial liberalization uh, there is a case for financial liberalization in particular in things which help the provision of basic banking services. For instance, in India, I think there would be a value in the extension of banking services into the villages, into the SMEs, uh, a real extension of uh, financial products uh, to uh, the mass market. 
But one needs to be careful about financial liberalization. And I actually think the Chinese authorities and the Indian authorities have a very sensible approach of saying, we're not just going to open the floodgates and immediately buy uh, all of the ideas of financial derivatives and trading and total liberalization. We'll go step by step and we'll see what works. Because as I said, finance is an area where it's not as simple as saying simply liberalizing. You have to be, you have to be cautious. The other thing, which of course is something that in the West, we can learn from what countries uh, in the East have already been doing, is the containment of a unnecessary, uh, ha potentially harmful uh, real estate booms. I mean, here in Hong Kong, uh, you have been, Hong Kong has been applying uh, for many years things like loan to value limits, ways of slowing down uh, property price booms, which we decided 30 years ago were old-fashioned and unnecessary and unreasonable limitations of the free market. And actually, we're realizing uh, that you and the Chinese and the Indians, through, for instance, through reserve requirement systems, have been applying some tools that maybe we need to think again about. China and Japan. China, semi-controlled economy. Japan's just injected a large amount of money into its economy through a government-led stimulus package. What do you feel about those policies? Well, in relation to Japan, what I argued in my uh, speech last night uh, was that they're doing uh, necessary things now. I think they're very bold measures. I think they'd have been much better to do them in smaller quantities 15 years ago. Uh, ben Bernanke argued back in 2003 that Japan, facing what Richard Koo calls a balance sheet recession, facing a low demand for credit, facing deflation, should have moved then to uh, a radical policy, or sometimes what's called helicopter money, of running larger fiscal deficits and financing them with money. Um, they didn't do that, or they didn't do that on a sufficiently large scale. And as a result, uh, in order to keep the economy in balance, they ran very large fiscal deficits, but they funded it with the issue of government debt. Now that government debt has now become enormous relative to uh, Japanese GDP. What uh, the Bank of Japan now doing is committing to buy that in very large a, a quantities. Um, I think that that is what they need to do now, and I'm supportive of what uh, Governor Karuda has now committed them to. Uh, but I think there are risks in it, and there are risks if you allow, through bad policy in the past, the accumulation of that huge amount of government debt. There are dangers that the scale of what you then need to do to get out of that problem uh, may be dangerous. There could be reactions on, uh, for instance, the foreign exchange market, or there may be uh, the ability to create a bit more inflation might get out of control. So I think they're doing the right things. But if they'd done a quarter of what they're doing now 10 or 15 years ago, it would have been a much better situation and much less risky uh, as a policy. Um, as for China, I mean, China is a very interesting economy at one level, aspects of a market economy, but aspects also of a directed economy. I mean, one of the things that China did very effectively in 2008-9 after the crisis was deliberately encourage uh, credit creation through the banking system to the state-owned enterprises, to local government, uh, to finance infrastructure and other forms of investment and stimulate the economy. I think that has given them a powerful lever uh, for uh, avoiding the recessions which have hit uh, the Western and developed economies. But again, it's not without risks. And if you try and do all of your stimulus through the provision of banking credit, and with that focused on the local governments and the state-owned enterprises, the danger is that it is continuing to bias the economy towards an investment focus. And China has this very strong investment focus in the economy, uh, not enough uh, personal consumption, a need to rebalance. And so the danger is that the policy that they're doing, although I think, again, the necessary policy to deal with the, post con the conditions after 2008-9, it has risks. There are risks that they might build up overinvestment in forms of infrastructure which are low return or wasteful or not needed. And it may be delaying uh, the really fundamental thing that happens to happen to the Chinese economy, which is to rebalance uh, towards consumption, which is what everybody's been talking about and the Chinese government has talked about for five to ten years, but where we've seen relatively little progress so far. 
And similar dangers exist in Japan as well. If you have um, what critics would say is a false injection of cash into the economy, what you're not doing is stimulating uh, domestic demand from the ground up. You're not fostering innovation. You're not fostering homegrown talent in that aspect. What would you say to that? I think that Japan's problems have been primarily macroeconomic and primarily to do with demand. I mean, th there's all sorts of things one can criticize about supply characteristics of the Japanese economy. But despite those criticisms, this is still a remarkably successful uh, industrial machine, uh, which still innovates, which manages to stay remarkably competitive uh, despite very high uh, real wages relative to global level because of you know quite stunning levels of productivity. So I think uh, I think the crucial thing to understand about Japan, I think over the last 20 years, uh, this has fundamentally been a, a set of macroeconomic policy and demand management mistakes. Of course, they could get better in all sorts of ways. One of the things that Japan needs to do is make much better use of the talent uh, of its women. I mean, it, it is still an extraordinary uh, uh, gender divided society in terms of the role of women, the a uh, role that they play in the workforce, and that is uh, a wasted uh, a talent. So there are all sorts of things that they could do in structural terms, but the fundamental thing to get right is the macroeconomics, and that's what they've had wrong for 20 years. Let's talk about GDP then, because one of the things here that we're talking about is coming up with new models of growth. Hmm. You've mentioned GDP before as um, not the best way to measure growth and success, and that particularly applies in this part of the world. Could you maybe explain that and what new model you would come up with? Well, I think when you look at GDP as a measure of growth, um, it has all sorts of statistical imperfections. But even more fundamentally, there's quite a lot of evidence that as people get richer, uh, as economies get richer, an average GDP per capita, average income per person, uh, it makes a lot of difference when you go from $1,000 a year to $10,000 a year to $15,000 a year. The transition which, for instance, China is on uh, at the moment of becoming a middle income eco economy. But once you get to 20, 25,000, the evidence of the last 30 years is that it's not fundamentally transformational uh, to human uh, uh, welfare because people are getting to some level of satiation in basic needs. And you enter an economy where a lot of consumption is not about things that could possibly uh, make you permanently happier. They're ways of uh, competing for status with one another, you know, buying a fashion good because, you know, you have to have it because everybody else is happening, uh, uh, needs it. Now, what we need to therefore realize is that we get to a point where further growth in GDP per capita should not be the absolute overriding objective. I think there's nothing wrong with it. I think it will tend to happen as a byproduct of other good things in the economy, uh, things like uh, innovation and creativity. But I think after, once you get to those high levels, the levels that the developed world have got to, we should see growth as the byproduct of other things that we want in themselves, rather than the be all and end all where it's desperately important to increase the rate of growth from two to two and a half percent. It's just not all that important. The other thing to say though is that uh, alongside the growth, it's very important to look at the distribution of growth. And if you look, America is the most extreme version of this. Despite a growing economy over the last 25 years, a lot of ordinary Americans in the bottom half of the distribution of income have not received an increase in their real income for several decades. And that's really quite stunning. You know, all of the benefits have gone to the top 10% and the vast majority of the benefits to the top 1% or so uh, of the population. That's a real break in the sort of American dream of everybody participating in increased prosperity. And I think we need to ask very searching questions about why that has uh, occurred, because it, it's that increase in inequality, uh, which has two aspects. It involves the bottom of the income distribution falling away from the middle, but also the top of the income distribution moving way away uh, uh, from the middle as well. And those are things that, as economists, we only imperfectly understand. But I think, don't think we can simply accept them and could be completely relaxed about them uh, because they will both corrode the ability of the market economy to deliver higher welfare, um, but they will also undermine political support for the market economy over time. Lord Adair Turner, thank you very much for talking to us here at the Fung Global Institute. Thank you.